Welcome into another episode of the 615 Sessions podcast presented by Two Rivers Ford and Superbook Sports. The great John Glennon of Sports Illustrated is here with us today. I am getting ready to ship off for an uncommonly long voyage to somehow get to Buffalo uh, for Monday Night Football, where the Titans will play and try and avoid going down 0-2. Hello, Johnny. Hello, Buck. How are you? I'm great. Uh, is, are you able to hear the live music in the background where I'm at right now? I cannot uh, cannot get that. Maybe if you uh, if you hum a few bars for me, you know, perhaps uh, perhaps that would get the job done. So, I mean, Burton has said that there's been media karaoke nights before. I've never gone to <laughs> one. I hear Kayla Anderson is particularly uh, aggressive with her song choices. <laughs> She uh, she can, as we all know about Kayla, there's a lot of energy, a lot of intensity there. Uh, let me tell you, when she uh, when she took it up on the stage with some some black velvet, uh, a very very strong showing. And uh, I have to say, uh, in addition, that you know, uh, some people you know need a need a drop or two of of alcohol perhaps before they step up on the live stage. Not the case for for Kayla karaoke Kayla. She went up there dry and uh, and belted that thing out. So. Uh, so very, very impressive. Uh, Wait, so you were a part of this? Where the hell was my invite? I don't know. I can't remember what city it was in. It was on the road, but I can't remember what city it was in. And it just seemed like the best idea at the time. And <laughs> next thing you know, uh, she's up there. And, and I believe it, it's still maybe floating around on somebody's video out there somewhere. So maybe we can dig it up. Well, God knows everything exists in perpetuity on the internet right now. Um, the Titans, speaking of intensity, uh, uh, lack of intensity is probably too harsh an accusation for the way they lost to the Giants. But, um, Johnny, I don't know how you can lose by one point to Daniel Jones when he gives you the Daniel Jones interception um, and expect to manage Josh Allen with just how many, like, fundamental mistakes their defense made, which is not something we're accustomed to seeing. Yeah, you know, and it was talked about again today was those those X plays, you know, the the obviously the two big Barkley runs and the uh, and the long touchdown pass to Sterling Shepard. It was pretty much either led to or accounted for uh, all three of the Giants touchdowns. And that and that's one thing that, that the Titans have been good against uh, over the years is is not giving up those kind of X plays. Uh, you know, and and for instance, the the one to Christian Fulton. You know, we talked to him about it, and then today we talked to to Shane Bowen about it. And it's pretty much as simple as, you know, he kind of got lulled to sleep a little bit on the play. Uh, you know, was was spending too much time looking in the backfield as opposed to maintaining a presence with the receiver. And automatically, you start to think at this point, you say, "Wow, if that's happening with Sterling Shepard and and Daniel Jones." You know, what might be the concern this week, um, you know, when, when you're going up against Josh Allen, Stefan Diggs, Gabriel Davis, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, uh, there, there clearly have to be some some changes in those X plays because that was that proved to be the uh, the, the biggest single difference in the in the game. Well, the way the way that like I looked at it after I did the after everybody got through, you know, fire Todd Downing, four straight raid uh, days of. <laughs> Sports Talk Radio, fire Todd Downing, fire Todd Downing. Mike Vrabel must not rely on talent if he's using Todd Downing as an OC, which was a particularly a vicious call uh, from a lovely woman named Sue Ann. But um, I think that I think that it's like it's such trash to put all of that on Todd in a way that like he becomes the face of it the same way that Shane Bowen did in 2020 with the defense. I'm sure he has his role to play. I don't know how. You know, I don't know how exactly much that turned with the third and one chig end around that we'll talk about, I'm sure, because Todd was asked about it today. But I guess, Johnny, when I talked to Greg Cosell about it, I just felt like like the Giants had the Derrick Henry game with explosive plays in the rushing attack and the Titans didn't. And that really was the only difference to me other than other than Randy missing the field goal at the end, which, of course, matters. But I just I didn't feel as terrible as it felt like everybody else wanted me to feel about the way that they lost. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I agree too. Where, you know, if Randy Bullock makes a field goal that he's certainly made uh, in the past, you know, we're all of a sudden talking about, Hey, look, Ryan Tannehill has done it again. He's led a game winning drive as he has very often uh, over the years that the Titans adapted to a new set of receivers pretty well in the in the passing game uh you know and that even though it was too close okay you know here are your titans want to know however 
uh, obviously uh, not the situation. And now you find yourself looking at that running game, I, I think, in, in particular. And, and I've said it before, you know, what would come to mind for me uh, with Derrick Henry in the run game against the Giants, the, the word was average. Um, you know, and that is not a word that we use very often with Derrick Henry and, and the Titans running game. There was one run uh, over 10 yards. That was it. It was, it was an 18 yard run. Um, and, you know, Derrick Henry talked today uh, about the fact that he had more opportunities. He agreed with Mike Brabel that there was meat left on the bone uh, in, in the running game. Uh, you know, he said there were a couple of times where he felt like he was trying to hit a home run instead of kind of trying to take you know, what was available. Um, so I, I think that was certainly an issue there. And I, and I also still have to think that maybe, you know, Derek Henry is a guy so self-critical, uh, you know, of, of himself that, that maybe he put such expectations on himself in this, the first regular season game back for him in, in quite a long time. Maybe he felt like that extra need to make that splash, to make that big run. And, and I think he was a little impatient uh, at times. So maybe we see that change just a little bit going into, into week two. You mean to tell me that Derrick Henry has actual human qualities that would prevent him from being <laughs> exceptional at all times, despite his physical cyborg build? It, it would seem, it would seem, um, you know, but uh, again, I, I think uh, a lot of things played a, a part in that too. And, and you know, I, I'm with you, you know, you can't all of a sudden, uh, you know, string up Todd, Todd Downing out, out of nowhere. But at the same time, you wonder if maybe going forward, they can help Derrick Henry out uh, just a little bit. I, I think, you know, when we look back at the numbers, I, I think it was about two thirds out of those first down plays were first down runs to Derrick Henry. Um, you know, and, and certainly the, the, the Giants were, were keying on that. I think there's probably a big reason for that. Derrick Henry was the Titans' known quantity on offense, and, and you know the Titans didn't really know what they had in the passing game uh, going into the into the first week as well. But I, I do think there has to be a little bit of change going forward uh, because if you look at some of those clips, you know from from Derrick Henry running, you know uh, there's there's not a lot of room in the box, and and uh, you know there's there's not a lot of room for for Derrick Henry to find holes either. Well, I mean. Uh... The uh, I'm blanking on the defensive tackle from Clemson's name that was taken a couple of picks before Jeffrey Simmons in that 19th draft. Dexter Lawrence and Leonard Williams are like decent NFL players, so it's reasonable to expect that the Giants had a plan to key off Derrick Henry, as most NFL defenses typically do. Um, I think, though, for me, Johnny, kind of going back to the downing thing and the first and 10 predictability yeah. of Derrick, you, you say that the Titans didn't necessarily know what they had in the passing game until you see it in, in live game action and Tannehill didn't play in the preseason, but like, I mean, Johnny, I feel like I knew what they had on offense, at least in the passing game after training camp, we watched Tannehill and these guys enough. I know there's not live rushers around him, but still, can I not be confident that Austin Hooper is going to be, and I know you wrote about this at SI.com. Can I not be confident in Ryan Tannehill's connection with Austin Hooper and Robert Woods, because we've seen it for two and a half months at this point. Well, that was what was interesting, yeah, to me. And as you noted, I, I, I did write about that. But, you know, three of the guys, to me, that, that were counted on for significant passing contributions, you know, you, you trade for Robert Woods, you sign a Hooper during the offseason to be your number one tight end. Uh, and really, Nick Westbrook-Akina is your most reliable guy coming back from last year. And you look at those three guys, and, and they wind up with three catches for 32 yards. And you're kind of, you know, scratching your head a little bit. Now, on the other hand, you know, you were throwing to Kyle Phillips, who had who had six catches and, and 66 yards, uh, you know, and, and maybe some of the other guys, Traylon Burks showed some some potential as well. Well, and Hilliard is a receiver. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. They schemed him up well, and, uh, you know, for those two touchdown passes also. Uh, um, but at the same time, to me, if, if you know, there's a reason you're, you're bringing in those guys uh, from outside. We saw what what appeared to be pretty good chemistry forming between Ryan Tannehill and these players in training camp. So you, yeah, as I say, it was a little puzzling to me. You look at Robert Woods' numbers, and, and of course he was playing in a completely different system in LA. But this guy's a workhorse. You know, I mean, the yeah. number of catches uh, he's had over the years. You know, I, 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 this was in my story too. He had 34 straight games of a minimum of of two catches, and all of a sudden, poof. 
uh, you know, that, that came to an Welcome end. Welcome to the Titans, buddy. Yeah, that's right. Uh, all of a sudden that, that ends in the season opener. So, I mean, you have to think. Uh, that they'll find ways to to get those guys more involved uh, starting this week in Buffalo. Is this like a Vrabel hang up? Because like you asked him about about the predictability on first and ten, Johnny, and like his answer was different than Todd's was today. At least the the portion of the Todd press conference that I heard on the radio show, where Mike's talking about, well, we don't necessarily like scheme things up to get guys go. I'm paraphrasing, of course, but we don't necessarily scheme things up to get guys going that way. We run our offense. We expect the players on the field to execute our offense. It's not about production from X, Y, and Z. It's about the production of the sum of the parts once they're out on the field together in Cody Hollister for 22 yards. And everybody, you know, looks at Cody Hollister and says, what the hell is this? And what, what is this personnel package? When I think they're just trying to run as many plays out of similar sets as humanly possible so that the, there's always the threat of Cody Hollister for 22 yards or something like that. But, it, I mean, at a certain point, the offense hasn't changed, really, since Matt LaFleur. Like, it's the same basic, fundamental, outside zone running concepts, play action pass. Um, the quarterback has, and they've gotten better uh, incrementally. But it just feels like this is the way that Frabel wants them to play. I, I would agree with you to, to a large extent. And that, that's kind of the way I, I tried to phrase the question to Mike Vrabel the other day was, you know, I, I, I asked – you know, do you feel like, uh, you know, the critique of being too predictable is accurate or or is it only accurate if that offense isn't productive? Like, you know, because, as you said, they've been running the same offense and, and certainly 2019, 2020, this was one of the best offenses in the game. And there haven't sure. been radical changes there outside of obviously this year. No, no A.J. Brown. Uh, um, but it's hard to complain now all of a sudden about running Derrick Henry a lot on first downs. You know, I don't have the exact numbers, but I would think they're probably very, very similar in, in 2019, 2020, when Derrick Henry is putting up big yards, even though he's running on first down a lot, uh, you know, and, and the Titans are having success on uh, on play action as well. Um, you, you did mention the, the personnel as well. And I think what the Titans do uh, at times is that, you know, they'll try to surprise teams by going with the, that running personnel and, and opting for a pass instead. Sometimes that works, sometimes not so well. And, and I think, you know, the, the one that came to mind for me, you know, red zone, third down uh, against the Giants, and they've got the traditional running personnel package in there. You know, I know Swain was in there. I think Tory Carter was in there uh, as well. And instead of, of the run of Derrick Henry, all of a sudden you've got Tannehill rolling out. Really looked like very few options available to him in the end zone. Um, and then winds up throwing late to Derrick Henry and the play just kind of fizzles and it winds up being a field goal instead. So it's one thing to say, hey, we're going to we're going to run this same personnel and surprise people from time to time. Uh, you know, when when we pass, it's another thing to actually execute that, because obviously when you have the run people in there, they're more accustomed to running themselves. And it turns out sometimes the the passes don't work as well. Yeah. And I, I think that I think that. I, it would be curious to see, and I'm sure some exceptional writer, perhaps one at SI.com, will go back and look at <laughs> things like Derrick Henry's success rate on first uh, first and 10 throughout the years. Um, but you're probably right. Uh, I would, or at least you're, at least it seems that they continue to operate this way. And it's not like, like it's, I mean, the whole reason Vrabel was hired is because the last coaching staff didn't seem terribly willing to adapt. And I know that's not the exclusive reason why Mike, Mike Malarkey and Terry Robisky aren't here anymore but it's the closest thing we've had or feel to it from the fans since then, even if the offense is markedly better now than it was during that time period. Um, but beyond that, like, I guess, Johnny, I'm not overwhelmingly concerned about the offense after one week. What I am concerned about is the fact that when you look at the, the five sacks that they got, it's coming almost exclusively from pressures from the inside from Jeff Simmons that the other guys on the outside are cleaning up. They're not necessarily getting great edge rush without Harold, who is, of course, their best pass rusher, even though Bud Dupree is pretty good and Weaver did well to finish up plays the way that they need him to. Um, heading into Buffalo, it's different because not only do they rush, do they rush with four or last year when we saw them, uh, they would do things like drop Harold into coverage, send David Long, drop Harold into coverage, send Elijah Molden. Elijah Molden's not available either, and Ugo Amadi's been playing the slot 
they're probably going to look to do something similar with those zone exchange pressures, but I, it's not lost on me that their tackling and run defense was substantially worse without Harold in the different places that they put him on the field. Yeah, I, I agree uh, completely, you know, and, and uh, you know, I, I think that that long Saquon Barkley run that, that really started the second half for the Giants was a, was a good uh, example there. You know, I think there was two or three uh, missed tackles uh, in that regard. You know, the one that stands out actually was was over towards the edge. He, he managed to get the edge in the first place. Uh, which sometimes Harold Landry is, is a big boost to. And then he gets around to Monty Hooker and boom, uh, he's up the field and, and, and galloping away at that point. And even when you look at the uh, something as simple as, as the two-point conversion, uh, you know, by, by Saquon Barkley. Now, I'm not saying all of this is related to Harold Landry, but we're talking about uh, tackling too. Sure. To me, you know, yeah, I, I, I thought that David Long, you know, had, had maybe a shot uh, at, at Saquon Barkley on that play and certainly a couple of cornerbacks namely McCreary had, had a pretty decent chance at him too, and just weren't able to take down a bigger back uh, in, in, in that kind of situation. So, uh, and then, yeah, it, when, when you get to the, the pass rush too, yeah, I, I think, you know, this to me is really where, where Bud Dupree is going to have to show, Hey, this is why the Titans signed me to an 82 and a half million dollar contract. Uh, you know, this is my year that the ACL situation is a year further removed now um, he's got to make some noise, uh, um, when it, when it comes to getting after the quarterback and, and, uh, you know, he has, he's become the, the leader certainly in the, in that department now that, that Harold Landry is out. And, uh, we know how important it is to, to get a little bit of pressure anyway on, uh, on Josh Allen this week. So certainly will will be a factor. I, I feel like the analysis all week long has largely been, yeah, they lost to the giants, but they beat the bills all the time and they win these games that they have no business winning. And you know, that's all well and good. Like there's, there's evidence to that effect, but I just, I don't know. At some point the dam has to break. Like, I don't think the bills are as overwhelming as they looked in the Thursday night opener of the NFL season against the Rams in LA. And I more often than not, certainly trust the Titans coaching staff to put the roster in a position to succeed in a game like this, but it just, it doesn't make sense for me to default to that, Johnny, like gut feeling type analysis when everything to the contrary, every time these teams play is that the bills should have the upper hand. And honestly could well have the, with Jeff Simmons, not the best thing that they do bear hug Josh Allen on fourth and one. It's literally decided by that much. Yeah, I, I agree. Now, you know, we've, we've talked all week about a couple of things, you know, how one, how well the Titans generally bounce back uh, from losses and two, how the Titans thrive in the in the underdog roles, uh, you know, and, and obviously you don't have to look too far back to see examples of both, you know, hammered in the season opener last year against Arizona. What do they do? They go out to a tough place to play. They go into Seattle and they come out with a W out there. A few weeks later, you know, they're, they're, they lose to the Jets. You know, again, we're like, oh, my goodness, what's going on? Well, they respond to that, uh, I believe, with six straight wins after that and that was when they had an incredible run of, of beating you know kansas city and buffalo and, and the part Rams. of the schedule we thought they had no shot in exactly exactly as well all that said i i kind of tend to to look at things a little bit uh the way you do here and and uh, you know buffalo is the team uh i picked to, to win the super bowl i'm one of 10 million people to to pick the bills to win the super bowl this year and you just look at so much you know most teams, you, you want to say, okay, boy, you really got to look at this offense. It is something else. Or, wow, what a, what a defense this team has. It's kind of hard with the Bills because you can go both ways. You know, it's it's like you're you're the the first thing you think of, of course, is Josh Allen and and Diggs and Allen and Dawson Knox and uh, you know Isaiah McKenzie and and on and on. Uh, and then they put up incredible points, but you kind of forget this was the number one defense in the league last year. Then you add Vaughn Miller to that. You get some bigger guys in the middle like Daquan Jones, uh, you know, the, the former Titans defender. And all of a sudden you're rolling out of defense like they did against the Rams, seven sacks, 15 quarterback hits. And I'm pretty sure they never blitzed in, the, in that oh, game was the stat that, 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 that came to mind. Yeah. So when you look at all that, Boy, I, you know, as, as much as I, I agree about the Titans bouncing back and, and liking being the underdog, 
it's tough to to you know just as you say kind of default and saying oh yeah they're gonna they're gonna do it again this week I, I think that challenge may wind up being just a little bit too much we'll we'll see I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing I've never been to Buffalo before so I'm looking forward to seeing what that looks like in a primetime game and a bunch of um, you know, God knows what they're consuming. Bills fans <laughs> are running through card tables and things of that nature. Perhaps I'll join them in the pregame, John. I haven't decided. Uh, that just that to me is a, I can, I can see you doing that, Buck. That to me is a very, very Buck rising situation. Perhaps, you know, uh, soaking in the environment. And so to share with your, oh. with your listeners back home. Soaking or, or sopping it up, depending on the, uh, <laughs> Depending on the context, yeah, Jimmy, Jimmy Wyatt went on that tighten up podcast that we have on A to Z, Johnny, and talked about how drunk I was the first couple of years that I was working on this beat. So it's not it's it's not lost on me that the audience just thinks I'm kind of a lush at this point. <laughs> and if, if I may be so bold as to share something personal, you, you mentioned before we got on, you get it the double header uh, this weekend, uh, Buck, of, of two, two of the um, uh, most uh, interesting cities in the in the U.S. Not only do you get yeah. Buffalo. But you will get Detroit uh, in a span of a few days this weekend. So you uh, some some might say you might need a, a couple of beverages to. to help I, I think I think there will be some consume between now and Monday Night Football. In the meantime, while I'm consuming beverages, you should be reading SI.com, where John Glennon and David Beauclair uh, do great work. Johnny, you have a podcast on the Believe Network as well that I know you guys do on a weekly basis. Yes, that is correct. Yep. And the name David of the podcast. Beauclair. Uh, it is Believe in Titans. Yeah, and it's David Beauclair and uh, former Titans defensive back, the Nord Denard Walker, uh, and myself. And we've enjoyed it. You know, we just started this year, and and uh, we've been having some good uh, some good lively debates on there. Uh, usually during the season, it's going to post. It's going to start posting on uh, on Monday nights. Uh, you know, so Monday night or, or, or Tuesday morning. Give us a uh, give us a listen if you can. Subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. Thank you, Johnny. Okay, thank you, Buck.